I turned it off. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay Latre. I am the CEO of ESA Solar, and we are the developer for the proposed Carroll Road project. So um, I will trade off a few slides here with my colleague Javier. And um, we'll skip through some of this stuff. Uh, Sarah did cover a lot, some of the slides that I have up here, so I won't waste a lot of your time talking about the same things again. But a lot of people ask us why are we here, why are we in Michigan, um, the sun doesn't shine here, uh, what's, why, why are we here? So I try to explain that the state has uh, set forth some goals that they'd like to achieve um, uh, in terms of an increased production from solar, wind, biomass, and geothermal. So I put some numbers up here on the screen for you guys to see, 15% by 2021, a target of 35% by 25. There was a recent bill introduced by the House and the Senate, uh, hasn't passed yet, it's just been introduced, to uh, increase the um, renewable portfolio standard to 100% by 2050. Um, so there, there's also, DTE and consumers have also set forth a lot of goals to increase uh, solar, ramp up solar. So all of these things together attract developers like myself to come to Michigan. Again, it's kind of similar map that Sarah had up. You can see that the southern part of Michigan, specifically Illinois County, one of the better counties for solar. Again, Sarah talked a little bit about this, a similar chart. Um, the reason that uh, some of the utilities are encouraging wind and solar, you can see over the past 10 years, the orange line, um, how much solar costs have declined. So they've decreased significantly, making it a much more competitive technology with like nuclear and gas and those sorts of production or generation sources. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how solar panels are made. Uh, and the fact that they, these panels don't have cadmium telluride, we have a solar panel over there in the corner. We can talk a little bit um, about how it's manufactured. I don't know if you want to bring the panel over here. Here. I can let you talk about this and I can hold the panel. Hi there, my name is Javier Latre. Um, I have a little bit of an accent, so if you guys don't understand what I'm saying, you can ask me, uh, I don't mind. I will try my best. Um, but this is a, a standard solar panel. You can use this solar panel with uh, big projects, so you can use the solar panel to put it in your house, in your roof, in your barn, or in your field. Um, so how the panel is made, uh, you basically have um, Silicon, which is the second uh, most common element in Earth. Uh, first one is oxygen. So you treat that silicon, you uh, uh, cut it in slices, and then you uh, connect them together on a solar panel to produce electricity that then is going to be fit in the grid. Um, you have glass on the top, and you have uh, uh, polymer in the back that is called Tetla to protect the water from, from coming inside. Um, and then you have a common aluminum frame that protects the panel. Oh, yeah. And you have, to make the connection, you have the junction box in the, in the back. And um, from here, this is DC, like the battery in your car. And this sticker over here tells you where it was produced, what voltage, what current, uh, what UL is meeting, and uh, what certificates does it have. So just to clarify the question earlier, this panel has zero cadmium telluride. The cadmium telluride that you see in modules is what we consider a thin film technology. So it does have cadmium telluride. 
this module does not. We get lots of questions about that. I think that's really important to clarify. And then here, this is a, like a normal solar plant. Uh, you basically have the solar panels looking south and um, connected together to have a proper voltage to uh, produce energy. Then um, these solar panels are connected together in combiner panels, which are the ones uh, in the main row, these little boxes on the main row next to the blue panels. And then once you connect them together, you push them to an inverter. The inverter will be the one that um, with power electronics uh, converts the DC into AC that then is fit to the grid. Uh, before we can fit it to the grid, we need a transformer that will elevate the voltage to the right uh, level so you can interconnect. Uh, many questions about what are really the um, composition of the solar panel or what it's made for, from. Um, so basically you have here a reference to the percentages. 76 is glass, so this is the from area. Then you have plastic in the bag, normally Tedler, is the white sheet that you can see in between the cells. And then you have a uh, percentage of silicon, the reason why the percentage of silicon is so small is because the uh, cells are really thin. So in really in volume, is really small. And then you have 1% of other metals that are the circuits that you can see on the front side. So these lines in here are the conductors that collect the electricity and feed it to the junction box in the back. So one of the main questions that people ask um, when we do these type of developments is the noise level of the inverters mainly. And um, um, with the setbacks and the ordinances that you have in most of the townships or counties, uh, the electronics are 150 or 200 feet away from the property line. So you don't really have noise uh, at the fence level. Um, but anyway, just to prove that we have a uh, contract, uh, this company here, Delight, <laughs> associates to uh, do a noise level test in uh, one of the projects in Michigan. Um, I think we have the results in the following pages. We have that uh, report, so if somebody is interested on, on it, you can very well uh, ask for it and we will send it to you guys. Um, so the first thing is to just have a reference on um, the amount of level. The noise level is uh, measured in decibels. So you can have the references of the decibel level and uh, what, what can you expect. So if you start uh, from the top, uh, 140, 130 is what uh, the maximum level will be in order to not cause pain or damages to your ears. Uh, you have 120 decibel a jackhammer, chainsaw 110, etc. And you go down to uh, 60 decibels, which is a normal conversation or um, 40 de decibels on the bottom. So basically, I, I like the uh, 85 to 60 decibel range because if you are outside uh, on a road, just the, the wind blowing is more than 60 decibels. So if there is a little bit of wind in the morning, you will be at 60, 65 decibels. The lowest recording that we had, that they had, was, as you can see, it was 46, 44.6 decibels. 
The highest was 68. We'll show you in a second where exactly where those readings were taken from. Uh, no noise was found beyond 350 feet from any of the inverter. So the site that we did this testing on is the site in Lapeer. So it is a, about a 50 megawatt site. Lots of inverters. Again, we'll show you the site plan here in a second. Of course, no noise is generated at night. Yeah, well, the inverter from the noise would be the same. These are central inverters, but this one is probably 30% of what we are planning. Okay, so location one is the most northern location, northern blue dot that you see at the top. Yes, yeah, no, sorry. This is site two. Site two, the blue dot at the very top is site two. The one to the south is site one. Just to clarify this. This is one and this is two. So, you can see from their test results, 270 feet from site one, they recorded 44 to 48 decibel reading slight noise from the inverter. Location two, interestingly enough, was almost 700 feet from the inverter, no noise at all, higher decibel reading because it was next to a road with traffic. Just We, we did hire this consultant because we did hear at the last meetings that there were some concerns regarding noise from the inverter. So we wanted to make sure that we had an independent consultant that was going to state otherwise. So again, there is some language in Rega's existing ordinance about noise compliance. So uh, we felt like this was a good representative site to send a consultant out to. Um, so here again, location three and location four approximately both location three, 400 feet from the inverter, or decibel reading of 46 to 50.3, no noise from the inverter. Location four, 46 to 40, 46.5 to 48.9 decibel reading, 460 feet from the inverter, no, no noise from the inverter. Uh, one other thing that we wanted to point out on this slide is, so you can see how they designed the site. All the inverters are on the interior of the site. These are central inverters, and so you want you want to make sure that you are careful and when you're designing the system to make sure that they are placed on the inside of it. That's, do you have anything to say about this slide? Mm -hmm. So here, uh, talking about the, the glare, um, basically the solar panel is to produce energy. So the more radiation that absorbs, the better. So because of that, what you're doing when you're manufacturing the, the solar panel, you have um, an anti-reflection coating that allows the panel to absorb most of the energy and not have any reflection. That's the reason why um, the panel is not reflecting that much energy because it's better for the panel to produce as much as possible, so the more radiation, the better. Uh, you have some reference there where um, uh, much less reflective than snow or concrete. Uh, that's just to give you a reference. Um, really, if you if you are next to a solar panel, if uh, uh, you drive through, if you are not looking at the solar panel directly, there is no reflection. Yeah, I, thought, I thought this slide was just important just to show you guys um, how many airport, airports across the US have solar, either on the roof or on campus. 
Um, so you've got Denver, Indianapolis, Tucson, Honolulu, Minneapolis, and Tampa. This isn't all of them, just to name a few of them. So every project generally seeks FAA approval, whether it's on an airport or not, just to make sure that there is not clear and it will not affect um, the FAA. Typically it gets a little bit stickier if you are within five miles of an airport, but um, we, tip we do these FAA studies anyway. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about, get lots of questions about NDAR, the PA116 um, regulations. So as, um, as Sarah mentioned, the priority of MDARD and the state is to make sure that ag land is returned to its original condition and that it is farmable after solar is removed. So uh, we as the developer post the decommissioning bond or the letter of credit, whichever is applicable posted by us, not by the landowners, not by the township, it's by the developer. Those costs, uh, according to uh, MDARD's requirements, are calculated by an independent engineer and approved by MDARD. Uh, the, as Sarah also talked a lot about, which I, I'll show you some pictures that I won't cover a lot, but we are required to uh, have cover crops planted and pollinator habitat. So this is for all of the land that we have in PA116, which is, uh, I would say, the majority of our land that we're leasing. Landowners will, uh, before construction starts, landowners will have to execute an amended PA116 contract with MDARD. We, as a developer, have the conditions of MDARD covered in our lease agreement. So. Um, all of the pollinator habitat requirements, all of the decommissioning bond requirements, all of these things that MDARD is requiring, we do put these in our lease agreements with our landowners. This is an example of um, a decommissioning bond. So uh, Javier can talk a little bit about this as well, but um, you, you, uh, you want to be sure from the township's perspective and also from MDARD that you've got enough juice in the bond or the letter of credit that you were able to decommission the site, remove the equipment, and restore it to its original condition. So we've put a little chart up here about what we believe is required to do that. So you see some equipment, a lot of it is labor, right? So you're going in, removing the um, galvanized posts, removing the racking, the panels, the fencing, restoring, restoring the property to its original condition. So it is a lot of labor. One other question I do get about about the bond: the surety is payable to the state of to the state of Michigan, which is an MDAR requirement. So the state holds the bond. This is uh, a pile driver. So uh, a lot of people are not sure how we drive the posts. It's a pretty simple piece of equipment that we get on site not very disruptive to the land. <coughs> so I put this quote up here because I thought it was really important uh, and I highlighted what I felt was the most important part of this quote. So it is a quote by, uh, by the governor. She says, we're protecting our environment while diversifying revenue options for Michigan farmers and supporting economic development we want to ensure that the placement of commercial solar panel arrays is consistent with farming operations. So a lot of people say, solar isn't farming. We look at it a little bit differently, and so does the state. The MDAR director, this administration decision will not, re not result in a loss of usable farmland. So MDAR's done a really good job of, again, making sure that the land is returning to its original condition. Just a couple pictures here. Won't spend a lot of time on this. We talked about this. Native grasses, pollinator habitat requirements. Uh, I think this will, this will be one of the last um, topics that we cover, I get a lot of questions about will solar affect my neighboring property value. 
So, um, <clears throat> again, we used the Lapeer site as an example. So, so we had a property appraiser do some evaluation on homes that were sold pre and post construction on the Lapeer site. So, I'll skip to the Lapeer site really quickly and come back to this. So, this is the this is Lapeer. So, the site was built in May of 2017. So you can, it's really, it's kind of difficult to see, but on the left hand side of the drawing, there's two black arrows. So there's two homes that have been sold since um, construction was completed. The address of the house that was sold is 1060 Cliff Drive. It was sold September of 2018, so approximately a year after construction. So. The column titled GBA is, square, is what you want to look at, square footage. So you can see that in comparison to the other houses, there was no effect on property values because the solar <coughs> farm was there. I'm happy to provide a copy of this report to anybody who would like to see a copy of it. And then I'll show you one other site. This one is a site in Texas, but I use it as an example because there's three sides of the solar farm that are surrounded by residential homes. So you'll see the three black airs. Three homes were sold after construction was complete. One other thing I'll note here. There's one house that is 110 feet from the solar farm. The closest home is, the, sorry, the closest home is 83 feet. The homes to the west are 110, to the south are 175. I can flip back to the map if anyone would like to see it again. No, I'm saying that there's on the three sides of the solar farm, I mean, there's how there's a huge residential development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a solar farm and there's three houses on the solar farm. Right, and so when I'm asking, so either one of your appraisals for their homes that were surrounded on all three sides of their property by the solar farm. Or yeah. Um, I'm just asking. I couldn't tell on the map. Well, I guess what I'm saying here is like what we're comparing is homes that have sold that are next to a solar farm. Right. And I was just asking if there were any that were are being surrounded. Um. Uh, I'd have to go through the map. I, I, I could probably. I don't know that offhand. Okay. Thank you. I would really appreciate. I can't talk from back here, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the solar farm was built in 2013. So let's take 7703 Redstone, for example. In 2012, the house sold for 149. The house was the solar farm was construction and constructed in 2013. In 2016, the house sold for 166. Again, I'm, I don't. I don't need to read all these values to you guys, right? But again, 7807 and 7734, same thing. 2012 sold for 136. In 2014, a year after construction was complete, the house was sold for 147. Again, 7734 Sundew. In 2012, the house sold for 117. In 2014, uh, it was 134. So. So again, the, the conclusion here at the bottom is there's no impact from the solar farm related to the sale of the home. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, just going through just going through some some facts here. I'll skip this slide really quick because this is duplicative, but who regulates solar in Michigan? 
the Michigan Public Service Commission. We seek uh, approvals from them, from FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, from the Drain Commissioner, um, the DOT, the FAA, Lenawee County, Riaga Township, or whoever the applicable township that we would be applying to, and MISO for connection to the grid. This is not a complete list of permits. It's more regulatory permits. We will have to go through normal and standard construction procedures, wetland, uh, environmental studies, and things of that sort as well. Uh, I did put the site plan up here. We can talk about it a little bit. Um, we do have a 100 foot setback from any non-residential uh, home lot line and 150 foot from any residential property line. Uh, the max height of the panels would be 14 feet, 50 foot setback from drain easements, solid lock fence. Um, we did calculate approximately what we're proposing in Ragas, 450 acres. 22, about 23 of those acres uh, are roads. So about 5% of the 450 acres would be roads. We're on the perimeter, the internal, inside the fence of the solar farm. Okay, this is my last slide. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what are the limits of solar in Ragat. So people seem to be concerned that Raga might become one large uh, solar field. So I did put up the substations in Raga, at least the ones that I'm aware of. So the green dots, so we put a green, the two green dots are distribution level substations. We drew a two mile radius around each distribution substation. And we did point out in the, the red dot is the Morocco sub on county line. And the yellow lines are transmission lines. So the reason that we drew a two mile radius around the distribution subs is because generally when you're connecting at a distribution sub and on a three phase line, <coughs> typically you don't want to get too, much, too far away from the substation. So the reason you don't want to do that is because uh, the three phase lines, they can't hold a lot of capacity. You get too far from the sub, then you uh, can get yourself into a lot of upgrades. So I just kind of wanted to give you guys an idea. These are all the subs that we found. There is a third sub, but I believe it's dedicated to the ethanol plant, so I did not put it here. Um, there are one other quick question. One other quick note about the Morocco sub. There is a 138. There are 138 lines feeding into the sub, uh, and three 45 kV lines feeding out. So 135, 138 kV is more of a common connection voltage than 345. It's because 345 is really high level distribution or high level transmission. So I didn't want I didn't I wanted to sort of see if I could alleviate some concerns that all of Riga is going to turn into one huge large solar field. And the reason I did this is because one thing you have to remember about solar is it has to have somewhere to go has to have the grid, it has to have access to transmission lines, it has to have access to substations. So uh, we need somewhere to put the power. So generally what we do as developers is we go where the substations are. That's really what we look for first. I think you have it backwards. The 345, the substation steps it down to the 138 kV, not the other way around. The 345 kV feed into the substation. Step it down to the 138. Yeah, Instead I get the opposite. Okay, what I, what I meant was that there's a 138 transmission line and a 345 kV transmission line. Yeah, but you said the 138 feeds in. Okay, sorry, I clarified yes. that thing. What I, what I meant to say was that there's a 138 kV transmission line and a 345 kV transmission line connecting at the sub. Yeah, you don't want to hook into that 345, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, that, that, that's it. We'll uh, open it up to the any uh, questions from the board or the planning commission first. And then, Lindsay, my question 
if people want those, can you have or get, if people want copies of those uh, values, house values, are they available if people would like to see them and, you know, so they can hold them and look at it? Yeah. Or I, I'd even go out a limb, is your PowerPoint something that sure. you would have copies of if people would like it? Sure. Because some of this, it may take seeing them. I mean, I was looking. I could read what was on there, but I don't think people in the back would have, sure. have seen that. So, mm -hmm. can yeah? Could you send me a copy of that, and I can make it available? Yep. Okay. Any anybody on the planning commission have questions? What's it sound like when the pile driver's in operation for a year? Um, those pile drivers are the same pile drivers that you will do on the road or any type of uh, construction. Yeah, and isn't there some noise from that? Yeah. And maybe some vibration? Um, to feel the vibration, you might have to be next door and be in a construction site. I suppose you won't be, but there is noise. Like any construction site, there is no of those pile driving. I, I just think that someplace in the previous information, it said that the construction would maybe take a year. I think that'd be pretty annoying. Um, I'm not sure where did you get that information, but I don't think it will be a year. Um, okay. This um, the projects take from three to five years to develop, but within six months they will be built. And from those six months, uh, probably three of them might be pile driving. So we go from one year to three months. Those three months will be pile driving. And what are your hours of operation for construction? Uh, it depends on the county or township. We are pretty open. Um, I think there are a few things that we talked about before and Sarah was concerned, like roads. Uh, we are open to any construction hours. We are open to do the roads on the uh, perimeter or do them in the middle of the field. Uh, we can reduce the number of rows and reduce the number of um, acres uh, impacted by the road. So uh, that could be, again, an open session where you ask questions or where there is an agreement, even if it's not written on an ordinance. I, I have a question. The um, Lapeer solar site, was that what, were those stationary panels, or was it that rotating? Uh, I think we can look. They're stationary. They're, sta they're stationary. stationary. Okay, because the reason I ask that is because you are you're um, thinking of putting. I mean, is your design for a tracker? Correct. So as those go through, there's going to be a little noise as it tracks the sun because those will have to incrementally <laughs> cross the horizon as it right. as, as it follows the sun so there would be some added noise there i mean it probably is minimal but it, you know there would be noise C correct and uh there are two things to the noise on the solar tracker the first thing is that the solar tracker follows the sun east to west so it's using six to eight hours to follow the sun so the amount of movement per minute is minimum um, and then uh, because you are 150 feet or 200 feet away from the road the noise that you can hear on the uh, road is minimum taking into account that uh, you're going to have cars coming in and out and uh, the background noise so uh, i can provide information though Whatever you think, uh, if you if you want some um, uh, white papers or if you want um, 
uh, shop reviews from the, from the manufacturer, I can do that. Uh, right. No, I, I'm just saying that it, in some respects it was an apples to apples type of comparison when, you know, with the noise, because yours is going to be a tracker and that was a stationary. So, granted, it, it won't, you'll hardly ever see it, but it, it could happen. And the other Correct. comment, the other comment I'd like to make is anybody, there is at Bowling Green, Ohio, and I'm not yaying or neighing it, I'm just saying that if you want to see a solar uh, array, you know, it, it's been functioning at Bowling Green, east of Bowling Green, on Bow Road. Is it is it Poe? Yeah. Um, you can drive down there and see it for your own. Uh, it is fenced, but you can. There's a service road that goes along the side of it, and you can you can see that. So I mean, you get a real good sense of what this may look like, and I think that's it's a 160 acres site and. There's about 140 acres covered with panels, I believe, is what it was. We we toured the planning commission toured that two years ago in the fall after it was just it was just coming on to um, it, they they had turned it over and they started producing power. So I mean that's a real good place to visit to get a sense of what you know what they're talking about. So that you know. Um, the other, well, that's, that's about all the questions I had. Um, I'm reading from the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, Environmental Stewardship Division, Commercial Solar Facilities on PA 116 Enrolled Land, 6-3 of 2019. And it says, utility scale solar facilities may be permitted on land enrolled in, the, in a farmland development rights agreement, PA 116 agreement, under certain circumstances. And I would like to say the word may might mean something too, but the first requirement is number one, the land proposed for the facility is necessary to complete a larger in scale solar facility. How does some, do you have any idea how you prove that this, that this land is necessary? That there might be some land that's not in P116 that would work just as well? Yeah, um, I guess we look at that a little bit differently, right? I mean, we're looking at it as the word necessary as the, the state consumers CTE and are they're asking for more solar, right? We're, we're unfortunately a lot of the land in Michigan, not only in Lenawee County, is in PA 116. So it, it is, and you guys know, it is a challenge to build large scale solar on land that's not in PA 116. Uh, also, uh, as you know, we're connecting to a, a high voltage substation. In order to do that, you you definitely need to have a certain amount of acres to get to to connect. I guess what I would, after reading that PA 116 this morning, I mean it it does give you a sense that in a project, if you're in PA 116, you'd have to prove to the state that taking that land out was vital for your for your project to go ahead though, correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't know the answer to that. For sure. Um, I can answer that. We called before we uh, got involved with this, we called call up there to make sure about this PA one sixteen and then talk to the governor's office and she said as long as everything was complied to with their tile and water and everything, that as long as you postponed your PA-1, we got to sign a paper that postpones our PA-116, but other than that, there's, there's no, no objections or anything from, from the state. Well, it would apply to the developer, though, probably not you as a farmer leasing it. But they would have to be, that would have to be necessary on their end. Yeah, but we signed the lease. It's not, they don't have nothing to do with it. We're the ones that's responsible for the PA 116, the landowner. Right. 
Right, but I think what that what they're bringing up is the developer on their end needs to make sure that your land is vital for their project. Yeah, well, the other, the, yeah. they wouldn't they wouldn't be after so it wasn't vital for the project. But she's not answering the question. <laughs> but she, no. she doesn't know. Well, what I said also was you guys know the substation we're connecting to, right? And so yeah. it's so what what I'm explaining is that if you're connecting to a high voltage substation, you need land and it needs to be contiguous. But that's not that's what not she asked. asked. She asked is that specified agricultural land necessary and you just said you didn't know. I don't know what the qualification the answer to these. I don't know what the qualifications of vital is. I don't know what the definition is. So I, I don't I don't want to say one way or the other. I, I don't know what vital is. I will I will say that a lot of our land in Michigan is in PA 116. We've had the same conversations that we've had with some of our landowners with, throughout the state and with MDARD, right? And so, as you can see from all the information that has been presented tonight, I mean, MDARD understands, and so does the state, that this land is going is is in PA 116, and it is going to be used for solar under certain conditions. I don't know what the definition of vital means. Shouldn't you know that as a developer coming in? Well, what, what I do know is that we've checked and we don't see any issue using this land. That's what I'll tell you. It says, it says is it vital to your project? And if you don't know, that makes me weary because you're wanting us to trust you, but you're not answering, you don't have answers to these questions that as a developer who's coming in to pull permits, not like, hey, we're just thinking about it. You can't even answer that. But. Right. Well, why don't you call MDARN and you can double check what I'm saying. <laughs> right? And so, well, if you, listen, I've asked. I'm asking a question. Right. And what I've told you and what I've mentioned is that I have talked to MDARN about the land that we are using and there's not a problem. I'm just saying he asked a question and you didn't have an answer. You know, as someone who I'm not, I don't, I don't have a side yet, but I will tell you this. To sneak in here and then you want us to trust what you say, you've lost some credibility with me sure. personally. Mm -hmm. So it's not even that I don't want it. I don't know. I come to these meetings to learn and to tell you right now, it is wrong of you to try to sneak in here and then want us to trust that. But why do you think I'm sneaking in here? I'm just curious. I mean, I, uh, Did you come in and try to, hey, this is what we want to do as a community? let's work together or did you try to sneak in a full permit and then everyone found out about it what I did was apply to the township right. that's all I'm saying I've read a ton on this recently and everything I've read says oh, really? the suggestion for solar developers is if you want to have a successful project you come into the community and you work with them because the second you don't and you lose trust it makes it really hard to move forward. And you're going to lose What do you call like this right here? Yeah. This whole thing. This thing over the too. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That, that's, enough. That, that's enough. Um, I would like to respond from a technical point of view. I'm not a lawyer and I don't understand the legal terms of the uh, yeah. Viva 116, but. Uh, we chose the site looking at the substation first, um, and the substation is a new substation with loads of capacity on an area that you have better sun hours or better radiation than anywhere else on the state. So from that point of view, then we look at land around the substation, and I don't know of any farmland next to the substation that is the uh, BI 116 compliant. So, from a technical point of view, from this particular project, is vital for me because if I don't have this land and there is no more land that is not BI 116, then I cannot do the project. So, from a technical point of view, I think it's vital to go and use the land around, and that's what we did. Are Are you ready? Are you? Would you take questions from the audience now? Me? No. E either, either or. Um, Kevin? With respect to the cadmium telluride, you said that your panels don't contain that. Of course, our ordinance would apply to all comers. Anybody would wish to develop here and just not you. So two thoughts. One is, would you recommend banning 
panels with cadmium telluride for our township and our zoning ordinance? And secondly, like they're doing in Europe, would you recommend that we require a mandatory recycling program so they don't end up in the landfill? They're doing that in other places. Um, for the first question, um, there are a lot of information one way or another uh, where you have people against Salmon Telluride and people in favor. Um, the company that has the Camion Telluride modules is American. It's the only American manufacturer that plays on the, uh, or the biggest uh, manufacturer that plays on the uh, grid scale, the grid scale projects. So they have developed more projects in the U.S. and uh, uh, build them than anybody else. Um, and I don't have with me, or I haven't seen any piece of information, maybe Sarah can chip in, but I haven't seen any report that uh, those panels have caused great damage on the surrounding areas. Um, so we will have to dig a little bit more on that, but I wouldn't ban them just because I don't have any information against them. Um, I know that there has been lots of talks about what happens if the modules break and how do you recycle them, but there is plenty of information out there on how to recycle the panels, and in fact there is an organization that provides information and does that in Europe and in the US. Um, and the second question was... Oh, uh, about recycling, again, there is an association, I think, on the back of the panels, you have a mark that says the panel is recyclable. Uh, so you can recycle any panel that we use, whether it is in the residential or in the... Maybe, maybe I the wasn't field. clear. I raised the question of cadmium telluride because you started out by assuring us your panels would not have them, which led me to believe that perhaps they had some risk. So I said, should we write zoning language that prohibits them? Then secondly, I ask you whether or not you think we could do what other places have done and simply require a mandatory recycling plan. You don't appear to have answered either of those, so I guess I'll let you try once more and then I'll be quiet. Okay, <laughs> really friendly. Um, so um, the, the, main reason, the main reason why we don't use cadmium telluride is because those are done by first solar and they are not standard modules, they have different dimensions and, um, um, and then they are diff difficult to exchange them. If you have to go back and replace module or there were any modification to the site, then you have to always go back to them. So what we use is a standard product, probably there are like uh, 100, 100 manufacturers that manufacture panels and all the panels have the same dimensions, the same connectors, the same type of cells, the same time of thickness in the frame, so then if you have to replace a panel, then you can go back and uh, uh, use any type of panel, not a specific manufacturer. So I hope I have answered your question now. Uh, the second question, uh, we use UL listed modules and we make sure that they are recyclable. What, what do you do and how do you do it? We are open to discuss with, with the board or have any requirements that you see fit. Um, I think it's important to make sure that uh, everything that you put on the field, you can recycle it and you can exchange it and it's uh, safe. So we are definitely fine with that. We are open to recommendations. Just, just to make it clear, so the problem with, in Kevin, what, what is the, the panel that you're talking about, that's the one made by First Solar in Toledo? And what is the, what's the downside of that because it's... The cadmium telluride has a very high toxicity level and that's one of the concerns with it, but my understanding, and they know more about it than I do, yes, I finally said that about something tonight. Um, they, uh, but I believe the thin film ones are more uh, energy efficient, but they're more expensive and they're made in the United States. The panels that I believe they're discussing are somewhat less efficient and largely imported, um, but appear to have less or none of the cadmium telluride. That's the limits of my knowledge there. I'm open to get any evidence that he provides and study it and then provide it to the board with a little study. I'm fine with that. 
Other questions? Just, just curious, what is your cost per kilowatt hour in a solar field for generation compared to natural gas? Um, we have a slide. Yeah, we have a slide between. And then, uh, one other part of that question too is, I find it interesting that you're connecting to a transmission <coughs> substation, not a distribution substation. So it doesn't really not going to benefit the community as far as power grid. That transmission substation is built, it's a highway. That power that's going onto that grid could end up in Chicago, Memphis, wherever. That's that's the whole purpose of a transmission grid. 138, 365, it's the wheel power. So whatever power is going on that grid, consumers so does street for solar. in Chicago, that's where it's going. So I was just curious as to what costs were compared to natural gas generation, which there's an you know, abundance of now. I was just wondering how that laid out. So, so, yeah, so generally the pricing is anywhere from three to five cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, for solar now, depending on where you put the power, who it's sold to, who the off taker is, right? Is it a college somewhere, or or is it whoever the whoever the off taker is, right? But generally that's a range. And yes, think of electricity flowing like water. So once we put it into the grid, we don't have any control over where it goes. The transmission operator really kind of directs the electricity based on where the need is. So you're right, it could go across the state. Uh, it definitely will not most likely be generated here locally because everything really set here is like distribution level. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, solar's a, a good idea, but uh, the sun doesn't shine all the time. How far away are we from some way of storing this energy that's copiously produced in the daytime when we need it 24 hours a day? Where's the batteries at in this technology? Where are we? How close are we to storing this stuff instead of just a uh, it's like the windmills. You see so many windmills that, that are sitting idle because you don't need them all at once. If you could store this stuff, it would be a different matter, but how far away are we from bottling this stuff? So, um, what we are doing now in, in many places in the states where you have more uh, solar de development like Massachusetts or um, uh, places like uh, uh, North Carolina or uh, California is that um, the inverters are like computers so although you don't have storage you use that computer to help the grid so whenever you have uh, lining or whenever you have a fault or whenever you have uh, not too much capacity on the line or you have problems with frequency or power the inverters even at night are able to provide for the grid and that's called um, grid features or ancillary services so that's what the solar can provide without the batteries now what the batteries are doing right now is uh, once you have a problem uh, maybe there is a lightning strike or maybe there is a circuit breaker that goes down then the battery for a period of time is able to provide electricity to the grid and then keep the grid uh, operative, operative until the fault is clear so that's where we are now there are lots of sites that have batteries but they don't store uh, and provide to the grid 100% of the electricity they store 100% of their energy but most of the time the grid or the PV is feeding to the grid and they just store small capacity in the batteries. Um, I will have to provide you with the right numbers but the uh, storage prices have been uh, decreasing in the last five years and mostly it's because those developments, right? The, the batteries and the inverters help the grid and there is more and more uh, installations where you have storage so the prices go down and then you use 
the storage to do something else. But I, I don't have like concrete numbers for you right now. Yes, I agree. I think we need to um, cut off discussion here and go on to our next um, new business topic, and that's a closed session that the uh, Planning Commission and the Township Board will go into a closed session. After that, we come out of that, we'll have public comment. So if you're willing to stay here, we'll be here when we'll uh, have anybody that wants to ask questions. Um, so we need to make a formal. Yeah. No, I have to talk about it.